My name is Michael Edwards. I'm the Iowa State Director for the campaign, and it's my great pleasure to welcome the next President of the United States, Tom Steyer. Thanks, Michael. Do you guys hear me? Look, everybody running for president has a big red X on their calendar for February 3rd, 2020, which is the date of the Iowa caucuses. But as someone who has a close family, I had another big date on my calendar, which was yesterday, December 15th. My Aunt Betsy turned 100 years old yesterday here in Iowa City. And we had a great celebration. It's always great to be here in Iowa City, but that was a special day for all of us. Look, these are uncertain times for Iowans and for all Americans. This is the biggest election in our lives. As we round out the year, we Democrats have to take a hard look at ourselves and ask, how do we win? Last week, Donald Trump stood before the Israeli-American Council and said, and I quote, you are brutal killers. You are not nice people at all, but you have to vote for me even if you don't like me, you're going to be my biggest supporters because you'll be out of business in 15 minutes if the Democrats get in. His words were hateful and anti-Semitic, and his premise is totally false. But beyond the bigotry, his words do reveal his entire 2020 strategy. To win, Donald Trump will stake his campaign on his so-called strength, which is the economy. And here's what American voters have to understand, that despite his racism, his lies, and his impeachable crimes, if Democrats don't nominate someone who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them on the economy, Donald Trump will win in 2020. Look, I have a lot of respect for the four leading Democratic candidates in this race. But here's the truth. None of them not Vice President Biden, not Senator Warren, not Senator Sanders, not Mayor Pete, has built or run a successful international business. None of them has a private sector track record of creating jobs. None of them has firsthand experience growing wealth and prosperity. I do. I started my business from scratch in a one-room office with no windows. For nearly three decades, I grew my company into a multi-billion dollar international enterprise. I spent 30 years studying our economy and economies around the world, and I know what makes them work. The Democratic Party and America needs a nominee who can go to Iowa and Michigan and Wisconsin and places all over this country and credibly talk about growth and prosperity. A nominee who can deliver a compelling narrative that puts people over profits, a nominee who can square up to Donald Trump and actually beat him on the economy. I believe that my experience and my track record make me the Democrat best prepared to be that nominee. Let's be clear. In 2016, we nominated the most experienced and qualified candidate in history, a person who I greatly admire. And Donald Trump still prevailed. If Democrats want to win in 2020, we need to realize that Donald Trump is a different kind of candidate who presents different challenges than anyone who has come before him. Conventional wisdom isn't going to work against Trump. We need new thinking and we need new leadership. And we know this will come down to the economy because presidential elections always do. So let's start by acknowledging another truth. Decades of unchecked capitalism have failed. And while the, pre the Trump presidency is making it worse, the answer is not socialism. No, the real answer is to make sure that the American people write the rules, not corporations. The real answer to historic inequality is not a government takeover of huge parts of our economy, but rather direct investment in the American people. We need to put people in the driver's seat and let the innovation and competition of the private sector power our growth and prosperity. That's how we build prosperity and opportunity for all of us, not just the top 
But before we talk about the path forward, we have to talk about how we got here. The state of America's economy is not Trump's failure alone. It's the result of decades of cruel <coughs> anti-worker Republican policies. Republican to Republicans told us that trickle-down economics would grow opportunity for everyone. But they were lying. Instead, they've hoarded all the money for themselves, and not a drop has trickled down to the American people. Money might be flowing, but it's siphoned off at the very top. Over the past 40 years, the Republican Party has pursued an aggressive, calculated assault on working families. Their playbook is simple. Cut their own taxes, weaken labor unions, starve education funding, slash health care spending, shred environmental protections, and put big business in charge of our democracy. And the result, historic levels of inequality with all the gains of the past 40 years going to the wealthiest amongst us, including me. In 2020, Democrats have the chance to end this. But as I said, only if we nominate a Democrat who can take the fight to Republicans and to Donald Trump on the economy. That's how this election will be won or lost. Trump's only path to victory, his chosen path, is to play an economic shell game long enough to win re-election, and then walk away and let someone else clean up his mess in 2024. Instead of the failed trickle-down theory of economics, we need a new democratic narrative of how we prosper and thrive together. As Democrats, we have to break the Republican lie that economic growth must sacrifice economic justice. Because that's just not true. In fact, long-term, fair, and fortified growth depends on a just economy. This is the richest country on Earth. But fewer and fewer people are able to climb out of poverty and live their American dream. While CEO pay has skyrocketed, workers' pay has stagnated, even while productivity keeps going up. So yes, the American economy has grown, but that growth is directly tied to more productive American workers who haven't seen any benefit from their, pro from their productivity. To the single mom with two jobs doing more work and having less to show for it, a rising GDP means nothing. To the young person freelancing in today's gig economy to pay for health insurance, or the college students burdened by overpriced tuition, a rising GDP means nothing. The way we measure economic success in this country is broken. The wrong metrics, the averages, mask the truth. And we can't manage what we don't measure. High employment doesn't help if jobs don't pay enough to live on. Economic growth doesn't matter if there's no wage growth to go along with it. And industry success is not success when it's poisoning our families, destabilizing the planet, and robbing from our children's futures. Among other things, we should be measuring economic mobility, the real opportunity for Americans to lift themselves up and improve their own lives. That's the American dream. We need a nominee who knows how to fight inequality and how to grow prosperity. As president, here are three key pieces of my plan to do both of those things. First, to attack inequality, America needs a wealth tax. This is where Mike Bloomberg and I disagree. There's been a historic and unjust redistribution of wealth over the last 40 years and in the wrong direction. A wealth tax is not a new burden. It's a long-needed fix. And when we put that money to use producti productively by investing it in education and research, we can build sustained, shared growth for the entire economy, not just for those at the top. Under my plan, anyone worth $32 million or more will pay one cent on the dollar. At $500 million, that goes up to one and a half cents. And at a billion dollars, that number hits two cents. Over a decade, though, that's $1.7 trillion 
in tax revenue, which will go towards things like fixing health care, creating new jobs in a clean energy economy, and funding education. I've been calling for a wealth tax long before I was running for president because it's the right thing to do and because I can get it done. Second, we need to be bold in how we balance the scales and fix an unfair tax system that favors the wealthy, particularly because the wealthy have been writing the rules. That's why I plan to treat all taxable income the same, paychecks and investment income. I'll end the capital gains giveaway, because it's not right that those who work for a living pay more in taxes than those who make money off passive investments. And I'll use the revenue from passive income tax increases to give a real tax break to working Americans. A 10% cut to millions of low-income and middle-class families. That's a 10% tax break for 95% of Americans. And third, I've put forward a people over profits economic plan which calls for investing in the American people and building up the innovation and competition of our thriving private sector. That's how we'll spur growth and prosperity for all of us. My plan will create millions of good paying, good paying union jobs in every part of the country and invest in education and research to bolster our greatest asset, which is the American people. Republicans would have you believe that our economy is a zero-sum game. And if you win, then your neighbor has to lose. That's just not true. We progressives know that nobody really wins unless everybody's winning. We know that one person reaches for their dreams and it helps others do the same. We know that we're all in this together is a much better philosophy than you're on your own. There's something else I have a track record on. I know what it takes to break the corporate stranglehold on our democracy, the same takeover that keeps us from a government that's truly of, by, and for the people. For 10 years, I've been organizing and empowering Americans to beat corporations and take back our power. Every step of the way, organized labor has been my first and best partner. As president, I will defend, uphold, and continue the fight for workers' rights and the rights of all unions. But the Democratic Party needs to recognize that our fight is not just with Donald Trump. We are fighting 40 years of a poisonous Republican narrative, a frame that says strong growth and opportunity for all cannot coexist. The government is the bad guy, and tax breaks for the rich are somehow good for the middle class. But just like Donald Trump's promises, none of that is true. Donald Trump promised to bring back manufacturing jobs, but passed a tax bill that shipped jobs overseas. His tax break for the wealthy hurts working people. His trade war alone has cost Iowans millions, and Iowa farm bankruptcies are at their highest since 2011. Trump's pattern of fraud is simple. He's treating the American people and the American economy like one of his Atlantic City casinos. He runs up the debt, he flirts with bankruptcy, he sticks us with the bill, and he moves on to swindle his next mark. You know, sometimes people ask me, you're a businessman just like Donald Trump, how are you any different? Well, I'm here to tell you, I couldn't be more different. Donald inherited hundreds of millions from his dad and lost it in bankruptcies, lost jobs, empty promises. He leaves failures and broken homes in his wake. He takes advantage of the good-willed and hardworking. He does well because others fail. I'm the exact opposite. I didn't inherit a dime. I spent my life as an investor, and I was good at it. When others put their trust in me, I found shared opportunities, and we shared in success. I'm a business person who respects the right to organize. What America needs is someone who knows how to grow prosperity for all. We need a president who will invest in the American people and put their interests first every time. 
Look, I want to acknowledge that every Democratic candidate shares core values on fairness and equality and access to opportunity, on affordable health care and a living wage as a right. It's a long list. Donald Trump will continue to embrace racism and misogyny and hate. That much is clear. His biggest and only play is to point to his so-called economic success, his fake economic success. And we as a party cannot and must not give him that chance. He's a con man, and I know I'm the most qualified to see through his game. I know I can expose him from, for the fraud that he is, and in 2020, I know I can beat him. People have asked me time and time again why I'm running for president. I'm not a governor or a congressman or a senator. I'm not even a politician. I'm not running to be something. I'm running to do something. The potential of our American promise is limitless but only if we can take back our rights and our freedom. The most heroic version of America is one where the people and only the people write the rules and determine our own destiny. And that's why I'm running, to do everything in my power to defend that promise, to finally restore a government that is truly of, by, and for the people. because of the changing economy, the automation of um, our workplace, the fact that we'll have driverless trucks in 15, 20 years, you know, that it's, it's what would have worked maybe in 1985, but it's not what's going to work now. We need an even bolder, newer vision. And would you just remind me of your name, ma'am? Christine. Christine. So let me say this. One of the things that I was not talking about explicitly today, but that's true, is climate is my number one priority, and we're going to have to rebuild America on an accelerated fashion. We always have to rebuild America because everything wears out. You know, manufacturing plants wear out, your car wears out, your refrigerator wears out, you have to replace your roof. We're always rebuilding America. But we're going to have to rebuild America on an, ex an accelerated fashion to make sure that we're sustainable and that we control our climate crisis. And that is going to create millions of good-paying jobs across this country, good-paying union jobs, because we have a gigantic task in front of us. In addition, there is going to, you know, he is worried about there being too little work. And I understand that. But we have the biggest task in history in front of us, which is to rebuild this country and to lead a revolution around the world to make sure we have clean energy and we have a sustainable world. So for the foreseeable future, we are in a place where it's true that there's going to be increased automation. It's true that artificial intelligence is going to come in. But we're going to be creating jobs in the millions at the exact same time. So rather than anticipate a future that, could, that may well happen, but which is not that close, we really have to do two things in the short run create these millions of good paying union jobs and work for a living wage for the people around this country who are working very hard and being dramatically underpaid. And so as far as I'm concerned, if we do those two tasks and then it turns out that his vision of the future afterwards turns out to be true, we can deal with that then. But right now we have very specific important tasks, which is to protect working Americans, make sure that they're paid fairly redo the tax system in a way that's actually progressive and fair and actually rebuild our economy in what's going to be the biggest work program in the history of America. Hello. Uh, I heard in your speech... Could you use your name just so people oh, know? My name's Eric Johnson. Eric, nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, I heard in your speech uh, you were interested in uh, using the private sector to uh, stimulate the economy and, and bring prosperity to 
Americans. And I've heard uh, in terms of climate change, there's some plans out there that uh, are projected to do that same thing um, instead of using a bunch of regulations to address climate change, or maybe in addition to regulations, you know, whatever it takes. Um, there's some plans to put a, a price on carbon and take that money and then right. send it back to each household in the U.S. and kind of create this uh, market incentive to do something about climate change. And I was wondering if you considered uh, that sort of idea as part of your uh, plan. So, Eric, let me say that our plan does not include a price on carbon, although I'm not opposed to it. I can say that in California, we've had over a decade to see what drives actual behavior towards clean energy, what drives behavior towards um, building efficiency, and what drives uh, clean energy, uh, drives uh, the world towards a different transportation system. We have a price on carbon in, in, in the context of a cap and trade system, but we also have put in rules for all of those things, how we generate energy, transportation, and building codes. So we have, we've actually seen, I'm not opposed to a price on carbon, but it has not dramatically impact behavior. It has raised money, and it has marginal impact on behavior, but the things that have really driven behavior and gotten the answers we need are actually regulations, is, is to say, this is how we're going to generate energy. This is how, the kind of cars we're going to produce. This is the, the buildings we're going to have. So I'm not opposed to it, but what I've seen in the real world is that the promise of the market that we can do this in effect without making decisions and just let the market mechanism work hasn't been that effective. And so looking at that, that's why I'm not opposed to it because it does have some positive impact and it does raise money. But using that as the centerpiece of how you're going to actually drive this change is, is something that I don't think is going to, I actually don't think it's going to work. And I think that, you know, what we're going to need is actually just to make some decisions and some rules and say to the private sector, go thou and prosper within these rules that work for the people of the United States. They'll, they'll bring you on. Thanks. Mr. Steyer, Steve Oval. Steve. Um, your third point included uh, a commitment to invest in people. Yeah. Uh, what's your plan for doing so, and, and would that include increased investments in skilled, technical, and apprenticeship training programs? Well, Steve, it absolutely specifically would include that. You know, I think we've dramatically underinvested in education in the country, and in particular, th there's a whole bunch. We invest in K through 12 education in a way that's particularly unfair to kids who live in low income districts. And the federal attempts to equalize that through Title I are, I completely support, but aren't nearly enough. I'm entirely in favor of pre-K, fully accessible pre-K to every kid in America, because I understand what a great investment it is in their future and our future. Um, I've talked within the last week specifically about a policy, a historically big policy to s support historically black colleges and universities with $125 billion over 10 years, because very much for the reason you're saying, but even more s w w with some other ideas within it, we need to make sure that we're supporting the institutions that provide opportunity to young people in our, in our society who are disadvantaged. And I use as an example historically black colleges and universities because they were organized in the first place to allow opportunity to young people who were specifically legally prevented from attending mainline universities in their states. They've produced over half of the African American judges, doctors, engineers, and teachers, and they've been starved for capital. Had some of the highest tuitions because they don't have big endowments for obvious reasons and are being starved of their state support. So in fact, that's a perfect example, as are the community colleges in my home state of California, which currently have 2.2 million kids going there with the opportunity and really gives low income kids a real chance to get the skill training that they need, maybe to catch up on what didn't happen in high school and specifically gives them a shot at a four year institution. So yes, I am a believer in more money into education, a broader mandate for what we're trying to accomplish, support of teachers, both in terms of income, but also in terms of the time they have to prepare, 
wraparound services in schools, the so-called community model of schooling, where you have a nurse, mental health facilities, food, healthy food, which is something that Kat Taylor and I have worked on for years to make sure that kids are fed and in a healthy way. So this is something I look at education as a, not a cost, but an investment. That the teachers are the stewards of the future of the United States. And actual prosperity to me is giving those young people the chance to be as productive as possible, to raise the productivity of the whole economy and the whole country, to give them the freedom to live up to their opportunity fairly so that there's mobility, so kids from low-income families have a chance to move up. This is something where I believe the Republican attitude of cut taxes and the next thing they do is cut education is profoundly anti-prosperity. It's profoundly anti-growth. It's, of course, deeply unjust. There's an implication in there of racism given the past history, which is one of the reasons I specifically cite historically black colleges and universities as an important, as important institutions of change, mobility, and opportunity, and justice. So I, that's a long answer to your question, but as you can tell, the, when we think about prosperity, we got to start thinking about it completely differently. We have to start thinking about prosperity being the success of American people and enabling that, supporting it, and investing it. So let's talk about student debt in general. I'll give you the exact policy, but let's put it in a context. There is somewhere about one and a half trillion dollars of student debt held by 44 million Americans. Half of the young people delay either getting married or having kids because of that student debt. They took on the debt in order to become educated, to do what society and their parents and everybody around them ask them to do, which is become better educated, more productive, and better citizens. That's the situation we're in. You should know in California, I've gone door to door in the legislature asking for a student borrower's bill of rights because as borrowers, they're treated differently and less well than people who borrow money for any other use in our society. They're specifically discriminated against. So what I've talked about in terms of a policy is one, change the interest rate. The average interest rates are ridiculously high, so you're not paying back your student debt. You're paying your student debt back multiple times because the interest rates rack up so fast that you don't get it. So when you pay money, it's not reducing your principal. It's just paying rates, and often the, the principal itself goes up over time. One is change the interest rate to 1%. Two is for people, I'm in favor of two years of free college, which is what we have in California. Three, for people who are doing a job that serves society. This is true for people in the military. If you're in the military for 10 years, your loan gets forgiven. It's part of your pay. That supposedly happens for other people, but it actually doesn't happen in the real world. For teachers, or for nurses, or for social workers, people who are doing jobs for the benefit of society where they're not at all maximizing their income, part of their pay should be a forgiveness of their student loan over 10 years, the way it is for military personnel, because that's part of their pay in result, as a result of them doing work for society. So what you end up with that is a situation where it's not free, but in fact, we're giving people a chance to pay it down one time if they you get two years free, and if you, in fact, are doing something that serves society specifically, it gets paid down over time as part of your pay. Should the government be run like a business? I'm not proposing to run it like a business. 
then why is your businessman credential qualify you for Because actually understanding what drives the economy is incredibly important for the president. It's, it's a question of understanding, in fact, what creates prosperity for a country and what, more than that, what creates prosperity for the people of the country. So, in fact, when we're looking forward, what we've seen is 40 years of economic growth as a country, which is not bad. The problem has been that the way that that money has been shared is terrible that, in fact, working people haven't had a raise for 40 years. So what we're talking about is, can we continue growth overall, but in a way that shares it across society so that people get the benefit of their participation and their contribution to American growth and prosperity? And that's something which we are going to have to be able to accomplish, which hasn't happened for 40 years. So in fact, we, there's something that's gone profoundly wrong in this country economically, at the same time that we've been kind of bragging about how good we are economically. But if you go, so the num you can show that in numbers, but I think much more than showing it in the numbers. I've been traveling around this country full time for seven years, organizing people, registering people on college campuses, running impeachment town halls, and now running. And what you can see is terrible stories about people being mistreated by this system because of the way it's set up. And my entire goal on this is to make sure that ends as fast as possible. That, in fact, we need to keep growing, but the way American workers are being treated is really reprehensible and upsetting. The way that American students are being treated is reprehensible and upsetting. We really have to make, we have to understand that these are basically cruel policies for American citizens. It's not right. There's a reason people are upset. It's upsetting. And so the fact is, I do have decades of thinking about what creates growth, but also decades of thinking about how does that growth actually help human beings in the society, which is the actual measure of success. And so, yeah, I think that it's really important to understand that both have to happen, that we have to have prosperity and growth but we also have to have justice and equality in our society, and we haven't had it. Thanks, guys. Um, Tom's going to be sticking around afterwards for folks in the audience that have a 